Excuse me.
ensuring that our requests line up with your desired request. Father, we're thankful for this church home, this gathering of your people. Father, we're grateful for the unity that we have in you, for our one-mindedness as we seek you and your kingdom, as we seek to share it with others. Help us to follow the example of your son, to strive to be more like him each and every day. <coughs> Father, we pray for the elders of this congregation as they lead us. Help them to shepherd this flock and bring it. You will be glorified. Father, we pray that you give them wisdom, courage to lead. Help them to look to your word. Father, we're thankful for our evangelists here. They help to spread the gospel. Father, we pray that your word would be spread both here in Atlanta and around the world through the men that we support. Through all the members of this congregation, help us to have a mind and a spirit that would look to share your word with others, to share that life. Father, we lift up those who are sick in our numbers. There are so many. Father, we pray for healing. We pray for comfort. Help us to look to you in our time of need. Father, we lift up those who are lost. We pray that the word would find purchase in your heart. Father, we love you and we thank you. And as we enter into this time of worship, Father, we pray that you would help us to spend this time with an undistracted heart. Help us to focus on you and your son as we remember his death, burial, and resurrection. As we remember the grace and the mercy that's been bestowed upon us through him. Father, in all these things we pray that our worship would be pleasing to you and would be a sweet smell of you. And that we would be edified and that our relationship with you Father, all these things we pray in your son's precious and holy name.
someone or something, uh, or an event maybe, uh, try to describe the value or maybe how much it means to us by thinking about uh, the void that would be left if that event had not happened or if that person was no longer in our lives or if the thing was no longer in our lives, what the void uh, would be left. Um, we commonly say things like, I don't know what I would do without them. So we think about, I uh, didn't have this person or something wouldn't have happened, what it would be like. And it may be a difficult exercise for us to think about what it would be like if Jesus had not died for our sins, if his sacrifice had not happened. It may be difficult to do that. I do think Romans chapter 5 uh, can help us think about that. We'll turn over to Romans chapter 5. Uh, this is a passage that we read uh, pretty often for, for good reason, but I think it can help us here. In Romans chapter 5, we'll begin with verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see the description there of all the things that were accomplished. All the things that were done for us because Jesus did die. And the implication is that if Jesus had not died, the sacrifice had not happened, we would not have those things. We would not be justified. We would not have peace with God. In fact, according to verse 9, we would be destined for the wrath of God. We'd have no access to grace. Certainly no hope to rejoice in. Certainly no, no rejoicing in our suffering. We would just be sinners before God. Sinners without the sacrifice of Jesus, we cannot be reconciled to God. And we're left far away, far away from God, which is really the worst condition uh, that we can be in. It's a dark place, probably beyond our, our comprehension, but because Christ did die for us, He did die for the ungodly, we are justified. We are at peace with God. We can have hope, we can rejoice in our sufferings, we're saved from His wrath, we're reconciled to Him, and there really is no better condition to be in than that, uh, to be reconciled uh, to God. So, may the full meaning and value of Jesus' sacrifice never be lost on us and never be, uh, never be lessened uh, in our hearts. Uh, let's think about these things uh, this morning. Now, I ask when to come forward. Father, we're we'll humbled by the fact that you sent your son to the cross in our place. We're humbled by the fact that you took on that job so we could have eternal life. I pray, Father, that we continue that memory beyond these next few moments and into our daily walk. We pray that as we take this bread, we, we still in man, please and be you, knowing that this is a representative of your broken body.
Good morning to each of you today. Thank you for choosing to come out and to study in God's Word and, of course, to worship our Father together. You might want to take your Bible over to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll begin in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, in just a second. And you see on the screen before you, we're going to be studying about confidence in our salvation. Confidence in our salvation. So this is a lesson mostly directed at Christians, that they would have that a sense of assurance and confidence. But certainly a lesson that's good for you if this is not a step you've taken yet. If you consider those things that are required. I've wanted to teach this lesson for about three months. We've had different things that have been required in that time period. And for about three months I've been looking at this, so I knew I had four or five ideas that I thought would be beneficial and helpful for us. But I wanted to go back and study some more and refresh to do the scriptures, so I read a few verses. And then there's a few more to read on this topic, and a few more, and a few more, and, and I tell you, it's just a really great feeling when you're studying up confidence and salvation to come across so many verses that are relevant and that speak to the confidence that we can have that you say, well, I can't even use all those. I can't even fit them in. There are so many things told to us in the scriptures that would give us a great confidence in the salvation that God wants to give us. And it begins with the character of God, right here in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Don't let this bother you. They told me they were going to do that. So I'm not worried about it. You shouldn't be either. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. When you think about our confidence, it begins with the character of God. Because in chapter 11, verse 6, he asks us to consider two things. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. It is just as important for us to believe that God exists, that God actually is, as it is important for us to believe in the character of God, he is a rewarder. If you believe that when you go to work every week, every week, every week, that at the end of the week or at the end of the month, your employer will reward the labors that you put in that month. We have to believe about God, not only that He is, but this essential quality, that He's a rewarder, that God is that he, he's good, that He's just, that He's faithful to His promises. Because sometimes people have this concept of God that He's vicious. That God is just looking for you at your weakest moment, and that's the moment he's going to call you to judgment. Or that God is just looking for you in some brutal way, and that God would take pleasure in our suffering or in our failure. Nothing can be further from the truth. We have a loving God, a redeeming, sacrificial God, who is the Lord of those who seek him. And so if you're here this morning and you're pursuing God, you're just beginning to seek after Him, that's an awfully good place to start. Because it's not enough to just have faith that He is this. He wants us to know that He has this great quality, that He is a reward. And as a God who rewards those who seek Him, He seeks a relationship with us and desires for that relationship to be characterized by confidence. This is true of every healthy relationship. Like, if you have a healthy relationship with your spouse, you trust them. If you have a healthy relationship with your teenager, you trust them. Now, you check on things, right, with their teenager, but you trust them. And if you have a healthy relationship with someone, you're going to have some normal worries or doubts from time to time. But generally, that relationship is characterized by trust and by confidence. Think of all the things God does to tell us that we can trust Him. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26, he tells us that we are more important to him than the birds of the air or the flowers of the field. And so trust him. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30, he tells us that he's numbered the very hairs of our head, that he knows us personally and deeply. We can trust him. He wants confidence to be in our relationship. And there's four different passages. We're not going to turn to all of these. But there are four different ways. Wait a minute. There's four different passages. Where he specifically uses this idea and this word of confidence. That when we pray to him, we approach him in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. We pray with confidence. That we just believe that he's listening and that he cares about our desires and our needs. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 28, he says, when he returns, you don't have to be just trembling in your boots, worried about the outcome of judgment. When he returns, you can meet that day with confidence. And even in judgment, in that time that you will stand before him, because he is a rewarder of those who seek him, you can have confidence. 
this, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Tell them about this list. Turn your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 through 20. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 through 20. And think about the confidence he wants us to have as he describes it as an anchor. Verse 17. In the same way, God desired even more to show the heirs of the purpose of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. And this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil. Notice that phrase in verse 19. This hope, it's sure, it's steadfast. This is a solid anchor. There in heaven, verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now think of this list on the screen for a second. Why is this hope sure and steadfast? Well, I want you to see from this huge list here that because it's not flimsy, it's not like there's just one little thing, and if that one little thing gets messed up, then the whole situation is ruined. That's not the picture. The picture is all the scriptures that God's grace is involved in our salvation, His promises, the sacrifice of Christ, this pursuit of righteousness that He wants to make us righteous, that He is just and justifier, faith, mercy, love. Covenants, redemption, sanctification, the seal of the Holy Spirit, discipline, the new birth of John 3, gratitude, transformation, adoption, service. All of these concepts are involved in our salvation. And I have been preaching long enough to know there's two reactions in the pews when you see that in this. There is somebody sitting in the pew this morning and they say, wow, that's awesome. Look at everything God has done. I can have confidence. How can I not? The anchor is sure and steadfast, but I know the second reaction. And that is, wait a minute, but what if I don't have enough of one of these? What, what if this week I didn't love God enough? Or, or what if this week I wasn't disciplined enough? Or, or what if I didn't serve enough? And, and with all of these different factors, I'll never be able to juggle that. Like, I can't juggle two or three balls. I certainly can't juggle all of these things. And these are big things. These are sanctification and righteousness. And how? How can I ever have confidence in salvation? Because how can I ever get all of those just right? I understand that that's how we feel sometimes. And the point of Hebrews chapter 6 in verse 20 is to say to us, you are not enough alone. But we are not alone in this. Our hope is well anchored because it doesn't depend on me just getting all of these right. It doesn't depend on me just being enough. It depends on the fact that His love is enough and His grace is enough and His holiness is enough. I am not enough, but Jesus is enough. And that anchor is there because Jesus has entered as a forerunner. Look at the words. For us. Our confidence is wonderful. And friends, our confidence is reasonable because of all that God has done for us. And so I want to take the lesson this morning. I won't do it at seven, so it's not a super short lesson. But, but seven things. And I want to whittle it down to these seven. But seven great concepts that give us confidence to see how Jesus is enough. Let's start with number one. We can have great confidence because God graciously makes us new in Christ. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, you're looking at a crowd of people that have no confidence. In fact, you're looking at a crowd of people that have become abundantly aware of their sin. That they have rejected God's Messiah. In fact, that they have nailed him to the cross. And they call out, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. For people that have attended here in the hills for a while, that verse is not new to you. We know this idea that in repentance and being baptized, not to impress your girlfriend, not to just impress this group of people, being baptized specifically for the forgiveness of your sins is what the scriptures say we can do. But do we forget sometimes to emphasize that when that step is taken, Jesus makes us new. Think about all the passages that talk about a new birth. Or 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, that you are a new creature. Or Romans chapter 6, verse 4, that there's a new life. Our confidence in salvation begins because God has made us new. I'm not that old guy anymore. That guy died. He's gone. Something new is here in his place. God is making us new. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, this is what God is doing for Paul, right? Paul is this persecutor. Paul is this one who's a violent aggressor against the church. And yet God made him new. Paul is told in Acts 22 verse 16, Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. He's been washed and made new. We have confidence because we've been made into this new man, this new family, this adoption of the Lord. But what happens when we're new, when we're fresh, or when we're there? Well, what we need to connect with this is that God has transferred us. He's made us old man and put him to death, but this new man is not just left somewhere in limbo, and this new man is not just left back in that domain of darkness, but chapter 1 verse 12 and 14 is really, uh, really direct about. It said that when he made you new, there was a transfer that took place. Read this please with me. Colossians chapter 1 verse, uh, verse 12 and 14. Verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see there at the end of verse 12, that phrase, the inheritance of the saints in light. And verse 13, he rescued us from this domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Now we're in the light. And that's the best place to be. That's the place that 1 John chapter 1 verse 6 says we walk daily. That we can walk in the light. That rather than be headed off towards the devil's hell, now I am headed towards a home with God. I'm walking in the light. I'm moving closer and closer towards that eternal hope every day. It's such a good news. It's such good news to know that he has made us new. And he's transferred us. Because walking in the light is really different than walking in the darkness. Come with me back to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. If you're in the auditorium class this segment, that's what we are studying. And Glenn's been doing a great job there. When we are walking new in Christ and being transferred into the light, something different happens. When we walk in the light, we're not depending on our own flawlessness. Or our own sinlessness. In fact, what happens when we're walking in the light is that we are abundantly aware of our sin. We say, oh wait, if that was the violation of God's commandment. Oh wait, that wasn't the right way to respond to the situation. It's like when the lights are turned on, we see more clearly. We see our sin more clearly when we are walking the light. But in the light, look what verse 7 says. If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son cleanses us from all sin. People who have been made new, and people who have been transferred into the light are depending on the cleansing blood of Jesus. And so how can we be confident? Again, not because I alone am doing this, but because his blood is there with me, because his blood is there helping me, because his blood is cleansing me from those sins. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
And if we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. There's that cleansing again. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm depending on the cleansing blood of Jesus each day. I want you to remember this passage. And on those days when you feel like, I just, I'm not enough. Not good enough. Not right enough. If you have had your sins washed away in Christ, if you've been made a new creature and transferred into the light, then you need to remember that Jesus is enough. And that that's who we depend on. Does that mean we ignore our sin? Does that mean we care flippantly about it? Not at all. We confess our sin as we become aware of it. But you know what? My hope, I'm being really clear about it. My hope is not even in me confessing every single thing I've ever done wrong. My, my hope is not that, oh, I didn't leave any out in my nighttime prayers. You go to the end of 1 John, and John says, you know there are other people praying for you. If, if I forget, if there's one of those sins that I just wasn't aware of, I forget to pray about that sin at the end of the day, and I die of a heart attack in my sleep, I'm still confident in my salvation. Because it's not just about me earning it and praying it out and having a perfect recollection of every sin I've ever committed. It's about His blood and about what He accomplished on the cross for us. And not only my prayer, but 1 John chapter 5 is talking about other people praying for me. And I know my mama is praying for me. And your mama is praying for you. Right? That there are people praying for us. It's not just faith on our lawlessness. It's based on Jesus' blood. But let's go further. What does the scripture say for a person who is actually walking in the light? This person who is walking in the light, they are accepted by God. Because God has chosen to credit faith as righteousness. Last week, I needed to do a little project around the house, so I headed off to Home Depot. I found the can of brown wood stain that I needed, and I walked up to the cash register, and I never for a moment thought that they would say, well, that product there will cost you two chickens and a bag of oats. <laughs> we don't barter for things. When we walk into Home Depot, we pull out that Visa or MasterCard and we swipe it and they accept it. And we don't even worry about them accepting cash or, or, or a card. That's just what we do. God accepts. God credits faith for righteousness. We don't, we don't walk through Home Depot with our livestock to find out how many cows and chickens we have to turn in here. And we don't walk before the throne of God with perfect righteousness. I wish we did. He wishes we did. But we don't. What he has done is sit his only begotten son and call us to put our faith in Jesus. Come with me to Romans chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. The beautiful thing about this is that this is not new information. What Paul argues in Romans chapter is that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And that this is the way God has always been dealing with His people. God has always been looking for people who have faith. So He brings the, the audience of Romans all the way back to Abraham. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, What shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Come down to verse 23. Now not only for his sake was it written, that it was credited to him, but for our sake also. That's his point. That you can go back and you can see that God was crediting the faith of Abraham. That God was crediting the faith of Noah. That God has been crediting faith all through history. And so it should not surprise us that the message of the gospel is for us to be a people of faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 24, for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him, 
who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. There are people in the room right now that have no confidence in salvation. Because they've never confessed this kind of faith. They've never confessed that Jesus is the Lord raised from the dead. They've never confessed that he was delivered for our transgressions, but was raised for our benefit, raised for our justification. Maybe there's somebody that wants to start the year that way. You want to start the year making that good confession and being buried in baptism and having your sins washed away. You need to be thinking about that this morning. But for those of us who have taken that step, our faith is credited as righteousness. That God was willing to do this for us is fantastic. So he goes into chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through whom I Lord, Jesus Christ. We've been set at peace. Again, because of lawlessness? No. Because of perfection? No. Because of faith that was credited as righteousness? Yes. We have been made at peace with God. Through whom we've obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice greatly in hope in the glory of God. This is really good news. And I want you to know, I'm not going to turn over and read it, but it's not confined just to Romans. I understand that sometimes people say, oh, my head hurts when I study Romans. Go look at Philippians 3 verse 9. It makes the exact same point. That God credits our faith as righteousness. And why wouldn't he? After all, God has paid a tremendous and precious price to save us. That's the argument that's made here in Romans, and that's the argument that's made back in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you turn there with me. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 18, and verse 19. We can be made new. And we are transferred into the light. And we walk in that light by faith. Because of what Jesus has paid to save us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things, like silver or gold, from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. God is not going to invest so much in us that he would give his son, and he would not just give his son to live, but he would give his son to die for us. God is not going to make such a huge investment in us and then just give up at the first sign of trouble, or give up at the first sign of weakness, or give up when we struggle in our frailties. God has invested so much in us. He is deeply interested in seeing this to completion. He is deeply interested in the salvation of our souls. I love what Romans 8 says, and I think this was referenced last Wednesday night. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, that after he has paid such a high price, how could he doubt his love? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Our confidence built around the trust that God has already earned by showing his great love, by making this great sacrifice. He paid a tremendous price. And so it should not surprise us that we can have confidence because he's continuing to develop, develop us. He's continuing to protect us. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 means more and more to me all the time. I think about this church at Philippi with Lydia, the seller of purple there in Acts chapter 16. And she's one of the first people to obey the gospel there. But she had to grow. She had to learn. And God had not given up on that young woman. And there's the Philippian jailer who came this close to taking his own life. But Paul and Silas stopped him and they preached the gospel to him. In the middle of the night, his whole family is baptized. But did God just walk away and say, that's it? No. Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi and said, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Even the tiny little letter of Jude 
ends with a statement of that kind of confidence. In verse, I think, 23 and verse 24. That God is still working with us. He is still perfecting us. And in that process, He is protecting that inheritance that He has promised that we will receive. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. There's that newness we talked about at the beginning of the lesson. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You remember when we read from Hebrews chapter 6? That that anchor was there, that Jesus had entered into the most holy place for you? Now here it is again. It's reserved in heaven for you. Verse 5, who are protected by the power of God. Through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That is fantastic. That God is protecting us, that God has this inheritance for us, which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fail away. But there is a danger here. And that is sometimes that people begin to get overconfident, right? <clears throat> they get so confident they begin to, to treat sin maybe recklessly. You know, I think one of the reasons we can have a strong and great confidence in our salvation is because the more we study these verses about confidence, the more diligent and grateful they actually make us. Although it, it seems counterintuitive, it seems like people would be maybe a little bit more reckless. Actually, the more you appreciate it and the higher your confidence gets, the more diligent and grateful you become. That's exactly what's happening again in the book of Hebrews where we began. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, down through verse 39. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34 says to us, You showed sympathy to the prisoners, and you accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Verse 34. When it would have been really easy for them to give up, when they were under persecution, when people were taking their property for them, because they believed they had a better possession, because they had confidence in a lasting salvation, they accepted these things joyfully. Verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. The more we grow in our confidence, the more we understand that Jesus is enough, the more we depend on His cleansing blood. We don't become reckless. We become those who are bold. We become those who have courage. We become those who do not shrink back, but instead we proclaim the gospel that others might have salvation, that others might have such a powerful confidence, knowing what God has accomplished and washing their sins away, knowing what God has accomplished and transferring us to His kingdom's life. We can walk in that light, knowing that He loves us, that He accepts our faith and works on our behalf. To say this. We are not of those who shrink back. And so you have Paul, who has done all of this preaching, saying in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. God, this is the same God that wrote Romans. That knew that faith was credited as righteousness. But remember, he wrote also that chapter where he said, the thing that I want to do, I don't always do it. And the thing that I don't want to do, sometimes I stumble and I sin and I go ahead and I do it. The guy that was conflicted comes to 
to a point to say, but I know there's a crown of righteousness for me. Because it's all reflected on all that Jesus accomplishes for us. He knew that he was in Christ. And that's the safest and the only place we can stay with confidence. So we invite you this morning to come and stand with Christ, to place your confidence in Him, not on your own flawlessness, but on what He has done for us through His death, burial, and resurrection. If you need to come and confess sin so that you are not one that shrinks back, or if you need to come and confess your faith in Him this morning, have your sins washed away, we stand ready to help you, and we stand in sin.